Scott Talley coming to you from the worldwide headquarters of Network Connection. And we are fortunate that Rob Rule has stopped by today. Rob's a realtor with Next Home a Realty Center. We're glad you're here. We're going to talk about real estate. Fantastic. It's my favorite I, subject. Me too. I'm not a realtor by any stretch of the imagination, but I love real estate. I often say that the times that I've bought commercial real estate, I've made more money than I did trying to run the company that was in them. <laughs> it's it's a great investment. It is a great investment. You know, the, uh, the for the younger people in the audience, the sooner you can get in, the better. That's all I can tell you. I tell my kids all the time, you're not going to go wrong with real estate. So let's jump in. You do mostly residential real estate. Almost exclusively. Yeah. And so uh, let's talk to a little bit about, um, you know, the best time to buy or sell. So, you know, people will ask me about a particular time of the year. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the, the best time is whenever you have a need, right? right. You know, if, if, if uh, you have a parent that died and you need to dispose of an asset or if you're moving, right, from Houston to San Diego, for example. Right. Um, and, and so... That's not a bad move. <laughs> no, Houston, no, it's I'm, not. <laughs> I'm a native Houstonian, but that's not a bad move. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But, um, you know, people will talk about the seasonality. Of, of of moving and and what we find is that you know there's there's basically four different sales seasons there's the spring which is the most common uh, that usually starts from about the middle of February until about the middle of May uh, and you'll find somewhere between thirty and thirty five percent of all home sales occur during that year uh, then. You get to about the end of May, and kids are getting out of school, and people are going on vacations, and you have a lull in the summertime. And so you continue to have sales in the summertime, but from about the middle of May until almost the uh, middle of September, uh, you will have a much slower period than what you had in the spring season. So maybe only about 20% of home sales occur during that time of year. Then kids get back into school, um, kid, uh, parents get into the PTA, they get down the routines with band and football and cheer and all that kind of stuff, and you see an upsurge. And so you'll see something like 25 to maybe even 30% of home sales occur in the fall. That's from about the middle of September until about the middle of November. Uh, and so you actually have more homes sold in the fall than you do in the summertime, which is kind of counterintuitive to a yeah, lot of people. Yeah, you would think I, you would think people would be moving for schools and getting in before school starts. Absolutely, stuff. absolutely. But but many times you'll find that fall season are people that um, you know want to get in before the end of the year. Maybe they're starting a new job January first, or you know what have you. Um, and then you know from you know the middle of November it does shut down. Uh, it is pretty quiet from the middle of November until about the middle of February. But the good news is is that the people that are looking during that time are very serious buyers. They're not brick kickers, you know, uh, that you might get in the in the springtime. Uh, people that are just maybe thinking about moving. People that are looking in the wintertime are very serious buyers because they have a definite need to move for one reason or the other. And uh, I would encourage anybody that's looking to sell their home in the wintertime not to hesitate uh, for that reason. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about those people that are looking to uh, to sell their home. What kind of things should should you do just at a minimum? I know every realtor wants the house to look perfect. So, you know, we can get top price and that, that, that's trying to help the consumer too. It's not a, a selfish thing, but what are the minimum things a homeowner should do? For sure. So, you know, everybody watches HGTV nowadays. Yeah. Um, everybody's very familiar with the concepts of, you know, decluttering and neutralizing and those kinds of things. Um, I, I would tell people not to uh, work, you know, you don't want to uh, have too much personal uh, effects out there, family photos, political speech, you know, those kinds of things. But if you were to have a photo or two of your family, not a problem. Um, of course, you want to make all the, the kind of minor repairs. You know, I, I find that most homes are uh, penalized when you have things that are nickel fixes. You know, uh, if you have a cracked switch plate, for example, mm -hmm. or if you have, um, you know, a, a chipped tile somewhere, those are the kinds of things that people really will punish you on. I can't tell you how many times I've had a buyer go through a house and open the oven and look at it and the oven's dirty and they say, oh, well, they're not even cleaning their oven. What's going on inside the walls that I can't even yeah. see? It's it's not rational. It's not fair. It not be fair, yeah. But it's you know the way that people think. Yeah. And and uh, you know uh, if you have something like a uh, burned out light bulb, you know. People don't flip the switch and say, oh, it's a burnout light bulb. They say, oh, my God, there's wiring problems yeah. and the house is going to burn down a week after I buy the home. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's those little fixes that when you're preparing your home for sale will bring the biggest bang for a buck. Well, I learned that the hard way years ago. I was helping uh, my wife sell her first condominium when we got married. And uh, I had put a sign in there, you know, uh, that we would replace the carpet uh, 
I was thinking, let them choose the carpet. I think we had 25 to 30 people go through there and not one offer. And we bought carpet and put it in there. And the second person walked through the house, bought the house. That So most people nowadays don't have the visualization skills to say, oh, you know, there's green carpet in there now, but imagine what this will look like with mm -hmm. gray carpet or whatever the trend is, you know. So um, for sure, you, you absolutely want to do that work. And, and one of the reasons is that, you know, a seller will say, well, you know, we've got to replace the carpet. It's only $2,000, right? A buyer goes in there and says, oh, my God, it's $2,000. I'm already bringing every penny I have for yes. my down payment and my closing yeah. costs and I don't, I'm not going to have that two grand post closing, even if you take it off my closing costs. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm scratching every nickel together just yeah, to make the deal work. Make the deal work. So you mentioned trends. What are some of the trends that are going on nowadays in the residential market? Well, uh, you know, it, Speaking more nationally, you're seeing a, a great surge of millennial buyers. You know, the, the, the time when a first time home buyer uh, comes into the market is usually around the age of 30. Well, that's right around where our millennial, you know, the front edge of our millennials now are there. So that's going to eventually be the biggest market in home sales. Your boomers, uh, which are now the second largest demographic, are downsizing. Um, some are going into, you know, over 55 communities and, and so those kinds of things. Now, the good news is that there's a lot of boomers that have, you know, money to give as gifts to the millennials to help them kind of get started in life or maybe some older children to help them get started in life. And so uh, you're seeing a big trend there. Um, nationally, uh, you're also seeing a, a, a tightening of inventory. And so a tightening of inventory means that you're seeing, of course, increasing prices. Mm -hmm. uh, you're seeing more multiple offer situations. Um, you know, and so people have to come, you know, be ready to go when they're looking. Uh, it's, it's not as much of a buyer's market it was maybe five, six years ago. Speaking locally, um, you know, we are seeing a little bit of a slowdown. Uh, you know, we had a big surge right after Harvey, right. Um, mm -hmm. mostly in the rental market, but there was a big disruptive bubble that happened in October, November, December of 26, 2017, of course. And so our 2018 numbers were down during, during October, November, December, and even into February. Uh, but now in February and March, you've seen a big tick up year over year from the past year. And so we're projecting that 20, uh, eight, 2019 is going to be a, a very healthy year. Uh, 2017 was a record year, even with Harvey. 2018 was a record year, you know, without having, ha mm -hmm. having to deal with Harvey. And we're projecting that 2019 will be a, a record year, even above 2018, but maybe not as much better than 2018 was over 2017. So you're probably going to see a little bit of a, uh, a slowdown uh, as we head into 2020. Really interesting. So uh, we talk often about how many different industries have been impacted by technology. And I'm, I'm, my wife's a realtor, and I think about you know, watching her, this is an industry that technology has really changed. Talk about some of those changes. Oh, fundamentally, absolutely. Uh, you know, someone was asking me that question the other day, and I said, you know, everything has changed and nothing has changed. You know, uh, back when I got in the business, back in 2001, uh, the Internet was still very, very new. Um, you know, I w had, had just missed the part where you would go to the real estate office and there was a big book there and you would look at homes and you would, maybe some of them had sold, maybe some of them hadn't, you know. So, um, you know, obviously people nowadays, when I came into the industry, people were spending 12 and 16 weeks in terms of their home search. Wow. Um, now, a lot of that was in your car driving around, right? A lot of it was, <laughs> absolutely was. And so, you know, nowadays, uh, first time home buyers, for example, spend 10 weeks in finding their home, but probably eight of those are behind a computer. And maybe only one or two of those are with me in the car or, you know, with whomever else it is. So they call you with, uh, hey, I've seen this home online. Is it still for sale? What do you think? Uh, let's take a look. It's a much more educated buyer. And that's good. That's that's a fantastic thing for my industry um, because there's less time they have to spend educating. I, I love to educate the client, um, but there's less time they have to spend in terms of, getting them from point A to point B, where point B is, okay, now I think I may be ready to, you know, really pull a trigger on a house. Yeah. And besides just the the, the, the great websites like Har has here in Houston, you've also got uh, promulgated contracts, right, that are online, a little bit easier for you to deal with and without all the paper and going back and forth and fax machines and Absolutely. driving across town and One of the getting big... qualified for a loan, right? I mean, all everything about it's a little bit easier. I oh, think. absolutely. You know, I I, uh, there's, I have a great loan partner within NIA, Matt Brown. Mm -hmm. I think you had him out here yeah, uh, a week yeah. or two ago. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. I can get a person to call Matt 
And in 15, 20 minutes, he can just, you know, hear what they have to say over the phone and give them, okay, you know, obviously we need to see documentation to back all this up, but I'm thinking you could probably qualify for something around 200,000 or 300,000 or, you know, whatever the number is, right? So, um, and that is one of the things that I absolutely encourage someone to do as they're going through the home buying process. Talk to a lender first before you even talk to a realtor. Mm -hmm. Um, I have so many people that will call me on a house that haven't spoken to a lender, haven't spoken to a realtor. They're just wanting to find more information, even wanting me to go show them this house. Yeah. And I'm like, guys, there's there's so many ways, uh, you know, if you do these few minor steps up front, that will make your search so much more pleasurable. You'll feel like you're more educated when it comes time to buy, um, and you'll feel better about a, probably the biggest financial decision yeah, you'll ever make. I once heard it said you wouldn't walk in and order a pizza without knowing if you had money in your pocket, right? Exactly. <laughs> but yet somebody's going to go look at homes and, Absolutely. and qualify. So besides the things we talked about with technology, uh, we've recently heard about these new players started coming to the market, seem to just be well-funded, you know, uh, companies that come in and just buy properties or will list your property for a smaller. Talk about that in, in a traditional realtor and what, what a person's missing out on. Absolutely. So, you know, those those big players, um, te- so there's a couple of things that are play in, in states outside of Texas, um, you know, a lot of home sales are common knowledge. You could look up what your neighbor's home sold for down the street if you lived in California or you lived in Washington mm-hmm. or you lived in you know New York, right? right. Um, and so, you know, those companies have access to that kind of information. And so you're seeing what are called iBuyers, what are out there now. And you'll get these big companies that will, uh, you know, if you have your home on the market or if you don't have your home on the market, you can call them and they'll say, we'll give you an offer of this. And, you know, nowadays it might be 85%, maybe even 90% of, you know, what the market value of that actual home is, right? And so for some people, that's a viable thing, especially if, you know, they're in a distressed situation or they've got to go right away. Um, it does take away some of the uncertainty of, you know, the process for them. Mm-hmm. So there's some value to that. Um, in Texas, Texas is a non-disclosure state. You know, you can't look up what my home sold for. I can't look up what your what your home sold for. Um, so the numbers tend to be even lower. They're probably going to be 80% or even lower wow. than uh, what you might be able to get on the market. And so, again, if you're in a distressed situation, you have to get rid of it and, and, and the place is a wreck and, and all that kind of stuff, you can look into that. But for the average person, you're probably going to be better off talking to a realtor that you trust, uh, making sure that they know about the market and having them give you an estimation and then going through the traditional sales process. Yeah. I mean, you think about it, it's the biggest purchase of your life or it's the biggest uh, sales. Most people, the equity they built in their home, you know, they wouldn't just hand over a $20,000 401k to somebody without getting it redeemed. And yet that's sort of what they're thinking about doing here. So a- Absolutely. And and what you're finding nowadays is like for, for your first time home buyers, uh, typically they pay about 99% of what list price is. Um, only nationwide, less than 10% of people, that's nationwide, um, paid less than 90% of list price. So there's an awful lot of, you know, you're talking about a $300,000 home. That's a lot of equity you're walking away from by having an iBuyer come in. You bet. And, and uh, that's the whole idea of the relationship, right, between a realtor and a buyer or seller is that they're going to trust you. Hopefully, they're going to use you again, and they're going to have a good experience with the services you bring. You mentioned the contact you have with the with the mortgage company as opposed to just being turned over to lending tree or somebody and sort of being out of control. So what um, uh, for the person that's thinking about selling their home, what's the typical time frame that a home sits on the market if it's priced right and in good shape? So across the country, that is about three weeks. Um, wow. You know, homes homes generally go pretty fast. Uh, usually what I'll find is, you know, if, if a home is not selling in that period of time, it's going to be one of three factors. Uh, I, in fact, I just sent out a video about this. Uh, one is, you know, some, some homes have actually have an odor and people aren't aware of it. Um, or there could be some minor fixes that, you know, the house needs to go through mm-hmm. carpet or, you know, whatever. Uh, but the single biggest reason is the home's not priced right. You know, and so, you know, I'll, I'll tell people all day long, you know, when buyers go out and they're looking at homes, um, they are using a comparative process. That's the only way they know to compare your house versus another home, right? And so um, if your home is the best home in the price range, then you'll get a contract and not until then. You know, if, if you're a $300,000 house, but you think you're a $330,000 house, um, you're being compared against those other $330,000 houses and you're going to pale in comparison. And so it's just going to matter. You know, you have to be the best one in the market. And until you get there, it's just not going to matter. And 
the market doesn't care about your personal financial situation. They don't care if you're going to New York and real estate is very expensive there or you're retiring and these are you know, the dollars that yeah. you're going to have to fund your retirement. They, they, they just don't care. You didn't care when you bought it. Yeah. They're not going to care when you sell it. Yeah. So that's a real, must be a real trick of the trade to try to, when you're going out on a listing call, not to lose the listing, you know, because the person wants so much money and yet you know realistically how to coach them to what it really is worth, right? Sure. Well, I, I will say that, you know, if someone is kind of within the, you know, maybe they're just outside the range and, and, and things are close, uh, many times we'll have an honest conversation with them. If somebody wants to try it on the market for a little while, that's okay. Just you want to make sure that you come correct very soon because the longer you sit on the market, the more the market is going to punish you for wow. for, for being, you know, incorrectly priced mm-hmm. in the first place. Now, if I come in and you say, I want to put your home on the market for 300000 and they say, oh, I think my home's for three hundred fifty, that may not even be a client that I want to work with. Right. 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 So let's switch gears here and talk about the client that's looking to purchase a home. Uh, what type of things do they need to line up ahead of time and look look for? Yeah, absolutely. So I referenced it once already. Speak to a lender mm-hmm. right away. You know, uh, there are so many good deals out there um, that people don't necessarily know about. And so uh, you want to talk to a lender, number one, because let's say you think you can afford a $300,000 house, but you can only afford a $200,000 house. Now you go out and you're looking at open houses or you're calling realtors and the $275,000 price range and you're filling your head with all these ideas and then you go find out what reality is and now everything that you're looking at pales in comparison, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe you can afford a $300,000 house and you're only looking at $200,000 houses because that's what you think you can afford. And you look around and maybe you go to open houses for six weeks in a row and you get so frustrated, you're just like, man, there's not going to be anything out there for me. Mm-hmm. So for sure, talk to a lender, number one. Number two, um, I would, if you have a relationship with a realtor that you like and trust, um, have them do a, a consultation with you. That's something that I love. I love to work with first-time home buyers. I love to work with you know, uh, people that haven't been in the market in 20 years because so much has changed. And, yeah. there, and there's so much information out there. And, and by sitting down and having a simple 30-minute conversation, you can really educate a buyer in terms of here's how the process is going to work. Here are the things to be looking out for. So that by the time we go and look at 8, 10, 12 houses, maybe even 15, and all of a sudden they say, okay, this is the one I want to go. They're writing that contract with so much confidence and and just a, a very uh, large sense of peace uh, when they go to bed at night that they're making the right decision. Yeah, and you know, let's be honest, there's... Um there's a lot of realtors. How many realtors in the Houston area? I think I. Well, there's over thirty thousand, and, and yet only about twenty percent of you guys are real professionals that are working your craft, and sure. trade, and working it professionally and full time. So, what is unique about the Houston market? Let's move it a little closer to home here. Sure. So, you know, there's a couple of things. Uh, you know, people talk about Houston and they talk about the sprawl that's here, mm-hmm. right? Uh, one of my favorite statistics about the city of Houston is that the urban core of Houston is the same size. You can fit four cities inside the urban core of Houston. You can fit, you can fit Chicago, Philadelphia, Detroit, and uh, Baltimore. All four of those cities at once into the city of Houston. Wow. There are 600 square miles here, right? <laughs> so when people talk about no, you know, no realtor that knows the area, they're not kidding. <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, yeah. Kingwood is a very different market than University Place, sure. right? Uh, when Enron went under, right, the rest of Houston was a pretty healthy market. But if you went to University Place, everybody was selling their home because yeah. they were losing their job, right? right? So, you know, for sure, um, you want to make sure that you know a, a realtor that, that knows that specific area, number one. Um, but mm-hmm. you know, the, the good thing about Houston with that sprawl is that our median price is actually lower than a lot of the country. People talk about the home affordability in Houston. Uh, nationwide, the median price is about $250,000. In Houston, it's about $230,000. So you're getting more bang for your buck here than you are in getting almost in every other city in the country. Um, and so, you know, uh, it, there's a lot more new construction here than you see maybe in uh, some other cities. Um, you know, there's there's places that, um, you know, obviously, you know, if you're living inside the loop, you're not going to find any new construction, right? right. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's really a very diverse market. Uh, we, are, we are a more diverse city than even New York. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, uh, there's there's uh, definitely considerations for religious, you know, uh, uh, facilities or for, um, you know, special, you know, special sports interests or for special cultural interests to know per- particular areas of town uh, that, that, are, that are very, very important. And so, uh, you know, used to not having zoning. 
uh, will you'll get a patchwork quilt of things. So just looking at, for example, say the West Cheshire, you'll have uh, the, the 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 Royal Oaks, uh, you know, what used to be the old mm-hmm. airport there, sure, right? Sure. Those are million dollar homes. You go across the street and they're basically you know crack house apartments like across the street. <laughs> That's so exactly right, yeah. so you know you have to know uh, uh, very you know very specifically some of the pitfalls of those kinds of areas, and it's and it's really very important to know someone about. Yeah. that knows those. Yeah, that's great advice. So how does the audience reach you by phone and email? Well, uh, by phone, they can reach me at 713-291-6077. Uh, by email, my email address is rob at goldenrulehomes.com. And um, that's really the most common way to reach me. Uh, I, I will, I'm always happy to tailor my communications to the needs of my client, whether that's text or email or phone or video chat or Facebook or whatever it is. Yeah, uh, great. I don't have any carrier pigeons. And I know you're in the relationship business, so tell me about your background in networking and, and, and a little bit of history there. Sure. So um, I've been with Networking in Action now for a little more than a year. Um, but yeah, my business is definitely a referral yeah. business for sure. Um, over 90 to 95 percent of my business comes as a result of referral. And it just it lends to the sense of trust that, you know, my clients have in me um, in, in the expertise. And, 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 you know, it helps me know, obviously, you know, where they're coming from and, and to tailor my service to what their needs are. Um, at the end of the day, um, I do really try to, you know, when, when we get into the real estate industry, when we go into real estate school, mm-hmm. people will say, you know, our teachers will say, you need to spend 75 to 80 percent of your time going and finding your next client. That's doing open houses. That's uh, doing marketing and advertising. That's doing what we call property time, where you sit in and people call in about wanting to see houses, Mm -hmm. right? I don't do any of those things. Um, What I've told my clients is, you know, let me dedicate my time to serving your needs. And if you like what I'm doing for you, you go tell your friends about me um, and, and let them know what a great job I've done. And if you can help bring clients to me, then I can spend my time helping you get what you want. That's awesome. Yeah, I, it's funny. The The history of Network in Action was exactly that. My wife got a real estate license. I was a marketing guy. And I told her, you can put your pretty pearls on. I can take all the pictures of you you want and advertise you all you want. You know, And I said, it's not going to work near as well as going out and networking and building relationships. That's exactly right. And that was the forefront of the history of the company. I also have to add that she was the first person ever to be kicked out of Network in Action. <laughs> I love telling that story, but right after she got her real estate license and we started the company uh, to give her and others like you a really professional way to network and to network with decision makers instead of a bunch of salespeople, she got pregnant with our fourth child and wasn't doing enough real estate. And so about five months in, I said, honey, I'm going to kick you out. And she said, why? And I said, well, you're not passing referrals to the mortgage or title company. And and so she was the first person to ever, she inspired the company and she was the first person to ever be kicked out. So listen, Rob, we really appreciate you coming in today. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you much.